Hi, everyone, and uh, I would like to thank all the organizers for this very much appreciated invitation. Uh, my name is Antonio Cabalba, I'm Chief Scientific Officer for Juno Genetics. So I've been asked to walk you through this topic, which is preconception genomic medicine. I will try to discuss with you what is the current status of all applications we can perform at this uh, specific time of and stage of pre-implantation uh, and uh, what we can also think and uh, consider as a future development in this, this field. So uh, I think uh, this invitation was indeed coming following this publication where uh, we had this uh, systematic review of the literature about the subject of the conception genomic medicine. And uh, of course, if you uh, would like to have a more uh, detailed uh, view, I will do my best in the next 30 minutes. But if you want to have more details, you, you're free to and welcome to read the paper and also the um, uh, related references. We started in our systematic reviews by the concept of genomic medicine that, as we all know well, uh, is meant to be uh, that situation where we use genetic information and data as the primary consideration to inform a diagnosis or any potential therapeutic option and approach uh, to be employed in medicine without much consideration for environmental uh, and lifestyle variability. And we translated this concept to the field of preconception genomics, where, of course, uh, we may derive and obtain many clinically useful information. So first of all, I think uh, in the context of uh, preconception genomics, um, uh, it is worth mentioning uh, that the most established application of uh, genetic sequencing in the preconception period, which is carrier screening, aiming to reveal the carrier status for recessive genetic diseases, well, we all know very well that carriers for recessive uh, genetic diseases are usually uh, do not present or manifest any symptoms of this condition, and therefore genetic testing is the only way that we have to get to know the carrier status. Uh, for the ones that are not very familiar with the topics, carrier screening is not a novel uh, application, it's not new. Uh, it has been performed for over 40 years, but primarily in selected population and for specific diseases that were segregating at a very high rate in a, a specific ethnicity or in a specific country or island. Now, um, uh, carrier screening aimed to test uh, for the carrier status of recessive diseases. This can be autosomal conditions, recessive diseases, where we, we need both members of the couple to be carrier of pathogenic variants in the same gene uh, to have a risk of 25% of having a child affected by that specific condition, or they can be, um, uh, it may be required only uh, the woman carrier of X linked genetic defects uh, to express the risk of 25% of having a male child affected by that specific condition. Now, these diseases are usually also referred as to rare diseases because individually. They, they are very infrequent, but when they are considered as a group, they become uh, relevant and highly prevalent. We know today that about 4% of couples are at increased risk of having a child affected with a recessive genetic condition, one of the several hundreds or even thousands that we may consider. We know that recessive diseases account for 20% of pediatric hospitalizations and mortality in developed countries, of course. And also, uh, we have learned and we have experienced that um, family history, positive or negative family history, the negative family history, sorry, is not informative uh, to tell us whether or not a couple uh, is at increased risk for one of the several genetic recessive genetic diseases. This field uh, went through several uh, steps and, uh, of course, uh, it evolved um, together with the evolving of technologies and the falling of cost for sequencing. Uh, today it is very complex to distinguish ethnicity in our multi-ethnic societies, as well as today is not convenient to sequence one gene at a time, as we all know well, and uh, both this consideration of Push the field towards the application of more expanded carrier screening where um, multiple genes are screened uh, together uh, and uh, where a panethnic approach can be applied, like universal carrier screening for 
uh, all couples that is including, of course, multiple condition capturing also some specific ethnic consideration. So today we, we're not talking anymore about carry screening in general. We usually talk about universal uh, carry screening that is made up of a gene panel that usually is composed of tens or hundreds of genetic conditions. So over the course of the year, there was the need to release some specific uh, professional um, guidelines and recommendations in order particularly to give guidance on how this panel of gene uh, should be composed. And uh, there is quite good consensus, wide consensus among scientific societies uh, where uh, the genes that are included in carry screening, they have to have um, a relatively high carry rate. Uh, usually today we talk about a carrier frequency of with a threshold of 1 in 200. They should have a detrimental effect on quality of life, very well established genotype, phenotype correlation and association. And also it should be all conditions that are uh, routinely tested during the course of prenatal or pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. Of course, clinical utility of carrier screening is clearly to inform the couple and uh, it provides clinical utility by giving couples reproductive autonomy, particularly when this is performed at the preconception stage, where the couple, the at risk couples, have the full spectrum of reproductive option available uh, to manage this, this risk, including preimplantation genetic testing. Um, the controversy and challenge in this field has been, uh, unfortunately, uh, the fact that. Uh, many companies start performing carry screening without much consideration about what was recommended by professional guidelines, just including condition that are actually not adherent to what uh, was recommended. And uh, indeed, we can see that for instance, 73% 70, of all condition in expanded carry screen panels in the Stevens et al. study uh, where did not meet indeed proposed criteria by professional guidelines in a more recent paper, uh, Chocosvili and colleagues showed very poor standardization of the among the, the 16 commercially available panels that were evaluated at that time, and uh, where the panel size ranged from 41 condition up to 1,792 condition with an overlapping of only three conditions that were screened by all these panels under evaluation. So this is just denoting the lack of standardization and the need uh, to uh, additional work towards providing a more um, standardized and uh, uh, scientifically grounded service and pro proposition in the field of carrier screening, uh, even though this is, of course, um, not questioning the clinical utility of this application by itself. So um, in our experience, for instance, uh, a way that uh, we envision to uh, work this out and to try to uh, develop a panel or to understand what was what, what would be a panel that is in accordance with professional guidelines, we use actual data from uh, wall exome sequencing of infertile, infertile couples. Uh, that was complemented also with separated tests for uh, uh, genes, challenging genes, such as um, SMN1 or uh, other genes that cannot be analyzed by exome sequencing. And um, uh, by incorporating all the criteria that were uh, developed and proposed by professional guidelines, we uh, estimated what was the aggregated fetal disease risk or highly penetrant severe childhood onset condition and what can be the best design of an expanded carrier screening panel to capture uh, this risk and to optimize sensitivity and cost effectiveness. So in this curve here, in this figure, you can see that uh, by looking at the exome-wide level, uh, we uh, observe that there is a core set of conditions that contribute the most uh, to the risk of uh, to the fetal disease risk, while adding conditions after a certain threshold is just adding carriers, but is not increasing the diagnostic yield towards at risk couples or towards the fetal disease risk. And this offers quite clear opportunity to develop carrier screening panels, gene panels that optimize sensitivity, cost effectiveness, and clinical utility. So now this paper, but also many other papers in the literature, if you design um, if you if you use and apply a well-designed panel for carrier screening, 
uh, you can see that about three to four percent of couples are at risk for one of the different conditions included. And uh, if the test um, is very well optimized, then you can um, estimate that the residual risk can be reduced down to 0.2.1% for those conditions that are uh, screened uh, into the panel. These findings were also corroborated by independent studies uh, and also in different ethnicities. As you can see here, the same cues can be uh, uh, observed uh, for different ethnicities, where also in this paper was the conclusion was that about 40 genes are sufficient to get uh, uh, the vast majority of the um, uh, to, to, to optimize sensitivity in, in carrier screening when panels are optimized and uh, develop following also uh, scientific recommendation and guidelines. More recently, we have uh, the CMG that has developed a tier-based uh, approach for uh, the development of gene panels in carrier screening. And at the end, using a little bit more relaxed thresholds for carrier frequency of one in 200, it was established that this should be kind of gold standard, or at least the best compromise uh, for a uh, proposition of an expanded carrier screening panel that is responsible and proportional and that can bring clinical utility to patients. There has been some discussion uh, in the, I mean, for, for few genes, few conditions, but in general, uh, our take home today is that carrier screening should, gene panels should range from 50 to 100 genes being included, and uh, this should be enough to cover uh, and to, to have a universal. Uh, panel that cover all the most important genetic risk for recessive diseases among the different ethnicities. So um, a very simple consideration, but I think it is always worth uh, mentioning the fact that uh, still, even after all uh, this evidence has been generated in, in, in the literature, uh, there are many places in the world, including my country in Italy or Europe in general, where uh, the education about carrier screening is not delivered uh, neither to couples trying to conceive or to pregnant women. Um, and this is in contrast, for instance, to what uh, it, it is performed for uh, the education about the risk of uh, aneuploidies, viable aneuploidies compatible, I mean, compatible with life, such as Down syndrome. Um, we can easily understand that aneuploidies are strongly correlated with advancing female age and their incidence in the neonatal population become significant usually after the age of 36, 37, uh, while in the previous year, uh, there is, I think, no doubt today that uh, the most significant genetic risk factor for, um, for a pregnancy or for couples trying to conceive in general is the risk for recessive genetic diseases. However, uh, there is this paradigm and this um, still um, point of consideration where uh, almost none uh, of our couples is receiving today at least the education to evaluate by themselves whether or not they want to screen, uh, to be screened for this genetic risk. And this is something that we need to work out and we need uh, for sure to uh, enhance and improve the communication and education throughout our society, as well as to develop frameworks that may allow couples to uh, receive this uh, type of information in case they, they will it. What is also important uh, as for any other genetic test and the provision of genetic test is also considerations about cost effectiveness. Here, uh, in this recent publication, we have addressed this uh, topic by looking and comparing and modeling the no screening strategies with a uh, screening approach that we have also divided according to the different tiers of the uh, recently released CMG guidelines for gene panel composition. And um, uh, just to cut the long story short, the paper, the paper is published, so you can read it, read it if you want, but uh, all different screening strategies were uh, superior in terms of cost benefit and cost effectiveness as compared to the no screening strategies, even after uh, varying all the parameters, or even after performing a two-way sensitivity analysis for all the parameters considered and for all the assumptions taken during the course of this modeling and this study. 
So um, in conclusion, I think uh, for what concern uh, carrier screening in the preconception field, this is very well established. There's no doubt about clinical utility of this approach. It's just a matter of, of course, improving more and further our understanding. We know every every genetic test and every diagnostic test in general is not perfect. There are still limitations to be a knowledge, like variance interpretation is always a challenge. Uh, but this, this, of course, is expected to uh, be reduced as uh, uh, the knowledge and the availability of large data set uh, increase. Um, frameworks should be established and uh, uh, for, for the education and for uh, the, the possibility of, of um, reaching couples with education, the possibility of performing testing uh, in case they have interest in screening for this risk. But, uh, today, I think uh, in, in also many countries worldwide, carrier screening is quite uh, established application. So another, um, I would like to redo this slide if possible, um, but of course we, we will deal with it at the end. Um, so, yeah. Uh, Apart from expanded carrier screening in the preconception uh, genomic space, I think one of the uh, additional information that we can obtain for genome-wide sequencing is related to the improved infertility diagnosis and uh, trying to understand the genetic basis of uh, infertility, in particular for conditions that are um, where, where infertility is the uh, main uh, clinical manifestation, and uh, uh, by doing so, we can learn about the molecular biology processes that are behind that and uh, trying to develop a uh, new therapeutic option for uh, infertile couples. Um, the spectrum, of course, and uh, uh, the review of all the causes of uh, genetics of infertility <laughs> would require uh, many many presentations and many uh, different uh, lectures, but uh, I just would like to go very quickly to give you some updates, for instance, in the context of male infertility. Uh, we have um, uh, we have had many new genes associated with maturation uh, at rest in the, during the male um, spermatogenesis, male gametogenesis, and uh, this can inform clinical utilities and can and is I mean resulting in the development of new uh, of new uh, application clinical application for instance for non-obstructive azospermia patients you know these patients they do not have sperm um, um, in the ejaculate and uh, before they need to go through surgical procedure. However, uh, as it was shown in this paper, if um, Following uh, exon sequencing and gene sequencing, we detect pathogenic variants in genes that are involved in the maturation um, of in, that are involved in maturation or rest, and the procedure is um, of course unsuccessful. So no sperm is recovered. Therefore, uh, we can think uh, of using sequencing before uh, any surgical procedure in the for sperm recovery and uh, having the for a kind of precision medicine application that can uh, avoid hopeless surgical procedure for patients with an obstructive antispermia. This is just an example uh, where a diagnostic yield was reported to be 23% and where all the cases where um, mutations, pathogenic variants in genes involving sperm maturation arrest were uh, indeed uh, had a failure in the recovery of sperm after the surgical procedure. So for what concern uh, the uh, female genetic of infertility, of course, the situation is more complex. Uh, this is a combination of, uh, at least for the most common conditions, such as polycystic ovarian syndrome or premature ovarian insufficiency or endometriosis, a combination of monogenic, polygenic, and environmental factor that I've not time to go through uh, today. Uh, what I would like to focus more in my in my next uh, half of my presentation is kind of a new field of 
um, and of knowledge and development. Uh, that is uh, the field where we are discovering new genes that are associated with specific and isolated infertility defects that are characterized by post maturation arrest or embryonic developmental arrest. This is a kind of specific infer infertility phenotypes or endophenotypes where that we can visualize only throughout IVF because only during an IVF treatment cycle we have access to the gametes or to uh, the pre-implantation embryos and we can actually identify some specific um, defects, uh, recurrent defects that may underlie a genetic origin. But very recently, um, we had uh, these two new uh, phenotypes that were added into the OMIN database, that is all set maturation defect and pre-implantation embryonic vitality. And again, this can be observed only uh, during the course of an IVF treatment cycles, and particularly in those patients that are left without the conclusive diagnosis of infertility, the idiopathic patients are the perfect target to perform these studies and to try to um, investigate into new gene disease association in the field of unexplained female infertility. These women are usually normal at all workup that we perform um, prior to an IVF treatment, but once we start, they start going through IVF, in some cases they can highlight some specific and recurrent uh, defects in the oocyte maturation, such as having all oocytes that are immature at the germinal vertical stage or at M1 stage, they can uh, show total fertilization failure in multiple IVF treatment cycles where uh, we do not see the normal sign of fertilization, but we see that all oocytes that were injected by a sperm do not fertilize or they fertilize abnormally with three or more pronuclei. Or sometimes we see recurrent pattern of embryonic developmental failure where we have embryos that fail to progress and develop to the blastoid stage. So most of the focus of this research was put towards the analysis of the female uh, genome, because uh, as we all know well, ovogenesis, of course, but also uh, the earlier stages of embryonic development are driven by maternal FA genes and the form uh, genetic studies that went to investigate uh, this particular infertility endophenotype, they focus the attention, the resources in sequencing the uh, female genome. This is a landmark paper that was published in 2016 by Feng and colleagues. And um, here they uh, looked in the sequence uh, women that were showing oocyte meiotic arrest in one or multiple area of treatment cycles. And as you can see here, they in 30% of the cases, they observed pathogenic variants in the tube gene. They performed some functional study and also uh, they uh, saw that uh, these variants in the tube genes, which is the major constituent of the meiotic spindle, they indeed cause a disruption of the meiotic spindle that is clearly explaining and uh, um, supporting uh, the, the, the phenotype and the observation during the IVF treatment cycles of oocyte immaturity and meiotic arrest. In the year that followed, uh, we had many additional studies that were performed um, to try to uh, discover and associate genes uh, to different um, oocyte maturation or embryo developmental failure and the phenotypes in infertility. And then, um, as you can see in this table where we have summarized all the current body of evidence, you can see that the vast majority of these genes were indeed um, clustering within the subcortical maternal complex, which is an essential multiprivate complex that is required for oocyte maturation and early embryo development. Uh, however, I think it is um, quite clear by looking at this table, one of the main limitations of this series of studies where, for instance, you can see that the vast majority of them were performed in a single ethnicity, so we need um, replication as well as um, we need uh, also additional evidence about functional studies of these gene disease associations. Um, in our experience, we observed that there was um, 
in this in this type of uh, um, research part, there was a lack, of course, of ethnic diversity. There was also a lack of standardized infertility and of phenotypes definition, um, meaning to say that in many of the studies that have de dealt with this topic, many of the cases were selected even after observing one one patient with three oocytes that failed to fertilize, just um, for giving you an example. So uh, an N of three, a number of three observation can also be due by chance. And therefore, uh, we wanted to develop some more robust statistical methodology to select cases, as we all know very well that in uh, gene genetic association studies, having a very well-defined phenotypes is paramount for getting uh, reliable and reproducible results. And there were also some other issues that mm, could be, uh, can, can be overcome due to the, I mean, development of more specific and standardized bioinformatic pipelines uh, that we have uh, tried to address uh, in, in, into the course of the of subsequent studies. So here, for instance, you can see what we tried to uh, develop as a statistical, statistically grounded methodology to select cases, in particular to identify lead uh, outliers from the normal distribution for several parameters that we can consider during an IVF treatment cycle, such as oocyte maturation, fertilization, and development plus stage, accounting also for any potential variability for maternal age or for any other clinical factor. And um, uh, in this in these statistical analysis and this statistical methodology, we are, of course, considering, among the other parameters, the abnormality rate observed in uh, multiple IVF treatment cycles, and also the number of observations that we have have been that we have collected for every individual case, uh, meaning to say that once we get a p-value or the level of difference from the, the benchmark value in this analysis, the p-value is also accounting for the uh, cell, for the number of observations as well as for the abnormality rate. And we can actually have a better selection of cases that is not subjective and uh, it is statistically uh, supported. Uh, we have also developed a, a specific uh, bioinformatic pipeline that includes several control data sets in order to control for false positive association. And um, uh, together with these developments, uh, we observe in a very large data set that about 25% um, of the women that had indeed um, OSAT immaturity or that were flagged as outlier for what concerned embryo development, they had pathogenic variants, either homozygous pathogenic variants or they were um, heterozygous um, for pathogenic variants, but the allelic variants in, in um, one of the candidate genes that was already reported. Why this field is uh, very promising? Because uh, by integrating uh, many different bioinformatic toolkits and knowledge uh, from human genomics, we can see that about 3,500 candidate genes are uh, developmentally lethal, uh, meaning to say that these genes are never uh, they do not, are never mutated in the general population or they are essential for uh, cell growth, cellular growth in vitro. And therefore, uh, it's possible to speculate that uh, these genes can be related to infertility and early uh, embryonic lethality. And therefore, the, this is giving us hope to improve and to boost our diagnostic sensitivity towards uh, the um, detection of new genes uh, and new uh, diagnostic strategies for um, infertility, unexplained infertility in particular. So what is, what is the clinical utility of um, this type of genetic application? I just would like to give you a couple of examples. Like for what concern, I can I can talk about the the, the, the case of PADI6. PADI6 was recently reported as a gene that is causative of early embryonic developmental arrest. Uh, you can see here in this picture and these families embryos, all the embryos uh, from women affected by biallelic uh, pathogenic variants in these genes, they are arrested at day three of development. 
However, PADD6 is a gene that is also very well known and was already known in clinical genetics because um, uh, it's, it's, it's a gene responsible for imprinting, multilocus imprinting disturbances and also for recurrent miscarriages due to polyploid conceptions. So here you can just see an example for PADD6, but uh, this is also valid for many other genes um, where uh, the screening and testing of these genes can also inform about the potential obstetrical and neonatal risk uh, in, in for career women. Another example of clinical utility, but this is a little bit more futuristic as a view, uh, but why it's also important to uh, keep working in this, this field and in this space, um, is uh, reported in this paper, where we have TRIP13, TRIP13 gene that was um, reported to be causative of OSAC maturation arrest. Of course, we also know very well TRIP13 in clinical genetic for other reason. Uh, different variants here as compared to the one causing Wilms tumor um, were reported to be responsible of OSAT maturation arrest. But what was interesting in this paper that they showed uh, the first evidence of a potential um, application, a therapeutic application in order to uh, rescue and recover from this phenotype of OSAT maturation arrest. In this study, the authors um, randomized some oocyte, a mature oocyte collected from a carrier women for, of, this, of the allelic missense pathogenic variants in TRIP13. They randomized um, the oocyte to receive injection of the complementary RNA sequence of the TRIP13 gene at the immature oocyte stage or to um, receive no treatment, only injection uh, like without any uh, cRNA being injected. And as you can see here in this figure, uh, all the injected oocyte here, they progress towards a normal oocyte maturation, and uh, they show a normal fertilization after injection uh, by um, ICSI, and they also progress uh, and, and display normal development to the blaster stage. Of course, this is just very preliminary data, it's just proof of concept that this procedure can be feasible, there is no safety level, uh, there is no clinical validation of this approach, it's just a concept, but it is important also to stimulate our development into these fields because if we can understand uh, the molecular mechanisms that are preventing uh, oocyte and embryos to progress throughout any specific stage, this may help in the future many patients to overcome some biological imposed barrier and to, of course, uh, get through a conception. So the last topic that I wanted to uh, review, uh, but I wanted to, uh, to spend just really uh, a few words is uh, why it's important to keep our investigation in preconception genomics is particularly also because we are learning more and more that infertility is not an isolated condition. Uh, we have uh, learned today that uh, infertility can just be a primary sign of uh, uh, multisystemic syndrome and uh, infertility can also uh, be associated with many different comorbidities and therefore the preconception stage represent an ideal window of opportunity to screen for additional risk of comorbidities and chronic diseases and to take preventive measures. We know that uh, biological pleiotropy is widespread in human genomics and also this is the reproductive axis does not make an exemptions. We know that there are many pathways, the DTR, DNA damage and repairs, as well as many other pathways that are um, linked uh, and, and, and they are crossing the reproductive axis, as well as many other organs and systems in our body. And for uh, it is uh, easy to understand uh, that genetic defects that are involved in reproduction can also be relevant for many other uh, for predisposing to many other diseases uh, later in life. Um, from an epidemiological perspective, I think the situation is becoming very clear. Uh, infertile men have very much a significantly higher risk to develop cancer as compared to fertile controls. Uh, the same is true for infertile women. 
uh, for cardiovascular diseases, for cancer, but in particular, we shall see also that about mortality, the life expectancy of infected women is significantly reduced in many different analyses and data sets as compared to fertile controls. So I think uh, for us working in the field of uh, reproductive genetics, I think is really important uh, also focusing to taking this seriously and focusing also on attention on what we can really do uh, at this particular stage in order to detect those women that have a substantial high risk of developing chronic diseases and trying to uh, inform about this risk and in order to, to put in place some preventive measures as, as much as possible at least. Another recent paper that is linking uh, infertility with comorbidity from more generic perspective is this recent publication uh, in New England Journal of Medicine, where it was reported that in women with unexplained infertility, the carrier burden of pathogenic or likely pathogenic variants in medically actionable genes that were recommended by the ACMG Society is 17%, which is uh, incredibly high. And uh, I think that if this data will be confirmed in subsequent study, this will immediately lead to unquestionable indication for genetic testing to all couple uh, and all women with unexplained infertility because medically actionable genes are, of course, highly penetrant and hereditary and have substantial effect on health and may also explain part of this link between infertility and uh, and, and comorbidities that we have seen uh, from uh, epidemiological studies. So um, in summary, I think um, that uh, in the space of preconception genomics, we have established application such as cover screening, as I discussed before. Uh, we have a very flourishing and growing field uh, that is that of improving our understanding, our diagnosis, the genetic process and capability, as well as uh, this is giving us a lot of new information about the biology, embryobiology, and, um, and in, in the field of embryology and gametogenesis. And um, uh, the hope that we all have, and the, this will lead to new treatment options for patients trying to conceive or suffering from infertility. And finally, of course, I think it would be responsible for us in the future also to work further in. Uh, trying to understand uh, what can be um, what, what would be the reasons and the genetic basis that are linking infertility with comorbidities and trying to develop uh, whether when, when and, and if appropriate some screening strategies uh, to inform early on time infertile couples about um, specific risk uh, for their later life for some specific chronic disease. So I think this is very fascinating fields, and I really uh, look forward to what uh, is coming next. Today we have really a huge possibility to, to explore a um, huge data set uh, also in the field of, uh, of IVF, and um, I'm really uh, excited to try to advance further this field and to uh, share uh, knowledge. So my work contributes towards the, prog the progress of rare disease research in the, in the context of understanding the clinical utility and application of screening for recessive genetic diseases at preconception stage, understanding the current status of genetic diagnosis of female infertility characterized by specific defects in oversight maturation and pre-implantation development, and also finally in understanding um, and to give future direction towards the development of targeted screening approaches for evaluating the infertile woman's individual risk for um, latent set comorbidities. I think uh, that's all on my side. I would like to uh, thank all the team at Juno for their passion and for their collaboration and friendship and all of you for listening. I'll be, I'll be um, delighted to uh, join the live Q&A session and answer to any question you may have. Thank you so much.